the thing is you have to be not have any expectation when you go and you start painting. Just don't have expectations. All paintings go through the same process where you, you start painting it and you think, wow, this is cool, this is cool, you love it, you love it, and then it like, falls into this hole. They call it the hole where you, it turns ugly and, and you hate it and you just gotta fight your way out of the hole and you just get, keep going and keep working at it, even if you think you're making it uglier. And eventually you get to a place where it's out of the hole and it's a better painting for it. But every painting follows that curve. The beginning process is the most fun because it really doesn't matter what you put on there. You can just be your four-year-old self. So, you know, hardly any of that underpainting will probably end up in the final piece. So you just, you just go, you just, you know, have fun. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can be bold in the beginning. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So for this being the first uh, of this kind of format with with the podcast, I'm thinking. Could we just have you, uh, for people who aren't familiar with your work and your, uh, uh, your life and everything, can you just uh, give your name and like where we're at and, and just a little bit about your art? Yeah, sure. Um, hey, everybody. My name's Ronnie Giannotti. I am in San Francisco. I've been painting for about 20, 25 years now, and I focus mainly on, on abstract pieces. Um, and I like to paint large and really get my whole body into the painting, so. Mm. Nice, so first question, yeah. uh, what are you up to nowadays? Um, in general? In general, or maybe with an emphasis on art, art but like, yeah. yeah, if there's something that overlaps, you could also do. Sure, yeah, so. Um, you know, as I said, I, I started painting about 20, 25 years ago, and I had a whole career before this in finance. And um, it, I'm finally taking these steps the past couple years of, of scaling back my business and passed it off to my business partner. And I'm trying to make a second career of, of painting and selling my art. So um, it has been an exciting past uh, two years, especially the past 12 months when I got picked up by a gallery in New York and here in San Francisco. And so things are starting to move and yeah, it, it makes me feel young again. So exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting. It, was, it was a big change. I remember in the podcast that, that I, one of the podcast interviews that I listened to preparing for this, uh, this talk, you mentioned how you uh, had a showing in New York and, and like we were saying earlier, when we were going through Instagram and stuff, it was very exciting and nerve wracking at the same time. Uh, yeah, walk me through that, with that process of getting ready for that. And did you prepare pieces specifically for that show or is it more like the company put you on and then you had some stuff? A little bit of both. Um, I had a piece that I was dying to show in New York. It's a, a 10 panel painting that's about 22 feet long and about six and a half feet tall that I was really hoping they would show and they did. So that took care of a lot of the wall space. And then I painted a couple new pieces for the show that would work with that large painting. So, so it was a little bit of both. And the night was equal parts terrifying and, and magnificent. And you know, that was always been a dream of mine to show my stuff in New York in a New York gallery. So it was, it was actually a dream that came true in, in my life. So I'm very happy about that. Hoping there's a second one. Yeah. Yeah. Did the, the, you've been with the current agency that you've been with since then? That, that yeah. I've been with them for two years. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What is that like to, to kind of be represented? Are they, are they like, what is their main function for you? Cause you're the actual 
creator of the art, yeah. but then they're doing like advertising or what's their main function? Yeah, exactly. They do advertising and then they try to match up your art with their client base. So they have um, uh, like uh, residential clients and then also have corporate collections. And then they see if any of your art will fit in with the what those people are looking for. So they kind of, you know, they're the middle, the middle person. Middle in, person. In it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so. I, I want to go back to kind of the early days. Yeah. Um, well, I guess this uh, this interview's going a little bit all over the place. I, I do want to I want to cover the early days, but also there's a question I think we should cover first, which is can you um, describe uh, in your own words like the major themes of your of your work? Yes, for for sure. Um, I tend to use as the impetus for my paintings memories. So I think like a lot of us, we have a lot of, a lot of these crucial memories in our past that have changed who we are as a person and that have um, or have stuck with us and resurface every so often, um, you know, well, you're, when you're dreaming, I mean, um, and they're kind of like stones in our shoes. They're always kind of there and they always have changed us. And so I try to pull on those memories and use them as a way for me to work through the memory. Um, and so that I can see it on my terms and not on their terms, kind of like, you know, taking the, that experience and pinning it like a butterfly to a board. Um, and that way I can move on. So a lot of what I do is it might be solipsistic, but it is uh, cathartic work. So and, I, my, my, and then what I hope is that um, the, the viewer will grok what I'm trying to do and grok instantly all those feelings and emotions. And they don't know what the experience was about, but they got the feelings and that they can then internalize them and help them through through their past traumas as well. So that's the goal. And that's usually what uh, is the basis for all my paintings. So you actually, you've, you feel like you've processed, sorry, it's tight quarters here. <laughs> uh, you feel like you've processed uh, stuff like emotional baggage slash trauma through, through, your work through exactly things. yeah exactly yeah. does it feel like a specific piece uh targets a specific past memory or thing yeah usually it is a piece as a memory so the big large piece i did the one that's 20 feet long i was a memory in high school um and it was a memory of uh, having an intimate relationship with somebody of a religious background. I went to Catholic high school. And so um, that big piece dealt through the, the trauma of, of um, having a relationship with a religious figure. With a religious? Yeah. A person who's... person religious. who's... Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So dealing with that, the fallout of that trauma. Uh, I yeah, see. Yeah. And it worked. It got it out of my system finally after all of that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's, I've never heard of, of that specific technique. I mean, I've heard of art. The, it's almost kind of a cliche. Like yeah. People would say a creative work is kind of a way to process it. it but I've never heard, I mean, someone be like a specific emotion or situation in the past that I had made a specific work and then that helped me get over it. Like yeah. that's... Yeah, that's uh, that's new. That's and, it really can, cool. and it can be something as simple as like I have a piece somewhere that I have. I have a very strong memory of ice skating on a lake in the middle of winter. And it was gray sky and grayer trees and gray on grays. And it was freezing. And there were some, you know, cattails poking out of the ice in the lake. And that just has that that vision is stuck in my head. And so I've painted it, you know, so it's, it could be stuff like that too. It doesn't have to be a heavy stuff, yeah. but I, you know, that said, I, there was a period in my life where I 
was moved out to San Francisco and I was 21 and within a matter of a year, like six people I knew had died of AIDS and I never really processed that. So I'm using painting to process that as well. So, yeah. I, when I look at your work and I see um, so much energy and when I went to your actual gallery showing the one of your friends took the word out of my mouth, kinetic, kineticness, uh, and there's so much color, I don't think of death. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, I look at it and I see life and I see color and, and vibrancy. Um, Great. I mean, that's just my take on it. But, um, you know, we were talking earlier about how your, your brother had unexpectedly passed and you're talking now about how um, you've experienced death and that's uh, maybe a theme. You're saying it's a theme in your... Yeah, yeah. It helps me cope with that. Like when my brother-in-law passed, uh, it really helped me through the process because it was tragic and unexpected. Yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, it doesn't, like, for it to be about death, it doesn't have to be black and, you know, gothic. Yeah. Um, it's it's the summation of their life, like all the, the great times we had together and all of that. So, you know, so it it... it it's a mix of emotions, I guess. It's not just like, now I'm painting about death. It's more yeah. like, gosh, this person died who was so important to me and there was all this beauty and then here's all this anger I have on it. And so hopefully all of that works its way out onto the, the canvas, so, yeah. yeah. So this painting um, is for my brother-in-law and it's called um, Hermano. He passed away unexpectedly eight years ago and uh, it devastated the family. So the way you know, I dealt with my grief was to think about him a lot and paint this homage to him. He and I had just gone to Argentina together for uh, two weeks, and um, we had spent a lot of time together, and he, he was, he's a really great guy, so we were all shaken. And so this painting, is very much how Robert lived. He was a very, very bright, basic, energetic guy. So I use a lot of blues and reds and greens. And it also reminds me of the streets that we hung out at in, uh, in Buenos Aires with all of the trees and the cafes and the sidewalks. And, and then there's some, there's some anger in there too. You know, it's, we're left with really some some angry emotions at his passing um, and so I painted it on unprimed canvas so most canvas they put some gesso over so that the paint stays on top of the the canvas and doesn't bleed into it but I wanted it to bleed you know I wanted this painting to bleed so you can see like some of the colors just bled in here and it gets a little muddy and it gets a little messy and angry and that's part of the, you know, the feelings that I had about his death. So, uh, and then there are some beautiful passages in like angry reds, happy reds, you know, peaceful greens, sad blues, happy blues. So, um, yeah, this one really got me through uh, that period of time in our lives. So. You had Italian immigrant grandparents who came here. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And... They, you landed in is Detroit, is yeah, that right? Detroit. Yeah, yeah. So you grew up there. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things in life, small and big. I feel actually when you were younger, I feel like it's uh, there's only a few big things that really shape us. They're outside of our control, mm -hmm. and and one of those things is is location. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm curious how growing up. Um, in Michigan and Detroit shaped you? Yeah, that, um, so growing up in Detroit in the 19, early 1970s, um, definitely shaped me as a person and as, as an artist. Um, I grew up in a rather poor neighborhood. Um, I was a bit of a loner. I, Growing up in Michigan, if you have allergies, you're, you're sick all summer. And this was before air, we could afford air conditioning. So I would spend the summer by myself indoors at the library because it was the only place in town that had air, air conditioning. So I became a big reader. And I did a series of paintings, one of which is 
behind me about the path I'd take to get to the library. So I would leave my house and I would run across the backyard, hop the fence, run across a field. It was all filled with weeds. I'd hold my breath till I could get to the library. And there in the library, I could breathe because it was clean air. So I had a whole series called Breathing Library um, that, uh, that, uh, that I've done. Um, and also just growing up in, in, in Detroit was, uh, was hard. It was, um, you know, in the, 80s, in the 70s and 80s, it wasn't as, as uh, uh, hadn't come back like it is right now. And so, um, you know, that hard edge stuff uh, worked its way into my paintings. We used to go like uh, running through um, empty buildings in Detroit at night when I was in high school. And, um, you know, it was a very dangerous thing to do and it was, it was fun and adventurous and those kinds of hard lines and, and uh, skeletons of buildings have definitely found their way into my painting in terms of mark making and, and slashes, so. Were there any artists in your family? Um, n well, yes, actually. My dad was an applied artist, so he worked for General Motors his whole life, and he was a clay sculptor. So he would make, they make life-size cars out of clay, and then they cast the dyes from them, and that's how they make the make the body parts from those dyes. So yeah, he he would take an entire car and like sculpt it down to the millimeter and you know curve of the of a fender or a steering wheel or so he was very artistic even though he wouldn't admit to that. And then my brother and I were in Italy um a couple years ago and we went to the hometown where my grandfather's from and there was a priest there who took us into a little chapel and the mural behind the altar was painted by Domenico Giannotti. So I'm assuming it's an uncle or uh, a, a direct relative of, of ours. So I guess somewhere back there, there is some, some fine arts. Oh, wow. Yeah. You never done like a 23andMe or anything, though, to try to trace it? What, yes, I have. And we, can't, we, we could only go back so many generations. And like he painted in the early 1700s, so it, it didn't go back that far. But yeah, I mean, it's, our whole family's from this little town there, so. Yeah. Where everyone's Janati. Where everyone's a Janati, yeah, okay. exactly. What, what does Janati mean? I don't know. I, I don't think it means anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not like a blacksmith or no, you know, exactly. there's no sim like, symbol. Right, like, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, before we move, move forward, I just want to give you a chance because we went down a little bit of a uh, cul-de-sac there talking about your family history and everything. Is there any other themes that you wanted to um, mention besides... Uh, the death and, and the kind of your past and your past emotional life that are really Im important to your work? Um, I would say beyond that, it's just um, uh, nature, shots of being in nature yeah. and trying to just kind of grasp a feeling of being surrounded by trees or being surrounded by boulders in Yosemite or, you know, that kind of thing. Definitely uh, um, these kind of pastoral themes work their way into my work to, as well, yeah. Um, who inspired you growing up? Um, I had a couple teachers who inspired me in grade school. One was a music teacher, one was the art teacher. Um, I had a cousin who was six, seven, eight years older than me, and mm -hmm. She was like the first one in our family to go to college, and she was very smart, and she was very in inspiring to me, um, and mm. and um, encouraged me to seek, you know, out my path, and my my destiny, of course, which then I ignored for forty five years of my life, mm. and instead went into business. So. Was there? Uh a specific conversation that really sticks out to you with this family member, or is it more just like her? Yeah, I think it's more just like her presence. Yeah, continually. Like she would take me to um, see a Shakespeare play. She would take me to the uh, museum of the the Walker uh, Art Center in Minneapolis. Um, you know, there's that kind of thing, and that that those ongoing. Um, uh, and uh, entrances to fine arts 
made, you know, really changed me. Yeah. She was just like exposing you to all exposed, types of exactly. culture and yeah. stuff constantly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. When you went to Paris and stuff for the year, was that, that was mid twenties or something like that? Or uh, it was, um, early thirties, early thirties. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So rolling back to like, mm, mid twenties, can you like give a kind of a, a brief day in the life of, of Ronnie, like what you were up to? Gosh. Yeah. In my mid twenties, um, I was either in graduate school for MBA program or else I was working for a financial services firm and I was, I was pretty miserable. Um, like, I think like a lot of people, you know, I was just raised that you have to make a living. You have to be respectable. You have to, you know, put in your, your, uh, work and then, um, you know, start a family, all that kind of thing. Yeah. So I was, uh, working mm -hmm. in finance, which I had zero interest in doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and that lasted on, on, until I was, you know, fortunate enough to, to take a break after working at a startup for a while and in my early thirties. And that's when I quit and I said, okay, enough. And, and I moved to Paris for a year to study art. So. Nice. What, what, what was that experience like? I mean, you, you said you went to the Louvre, you, you were practicing drawings and stuff. Yes. Uh, was it just in Paris or were you traveling around France I traveled and stuff? all over, but I mean, I mean, there's so much to see, even in like one neighborhood of Paris, you could spend your life there and, and, and come away richer for just the art in, in, in that 10 block radius. But, um, yeah, I would get up and go to museums every day and sketch, uh, from the masters. And at the time I was doing mostly like figurative sketching. So, you know, but go to like the Picasso museum and the Louvre and, um, uh, and then spend the nights, you know, reading French literature. And it was, it was pretty transformative. Um, and so I spent a year there in 2000 and then I came back totally different person, but I needed a, a day job. So I started a creative agency, um, with a partner and we helped, um, we went back to financial services and we helped those companies launch products uh, online. So to develop a brand, like we, we help them do brand identities and then, um, do how they, you know, how to position their product and do product packaging and then build their website. And so it was really like a creative way to incorporate what I had known to, that made money into something more palatable. So, you know, we've been doing that for 20 years and that's now what I'm stepping away from to focus on painting full time. Did you do art while you were like drawings yes. or anything like oh, yeah. at the creative agency? Yeah, my, okay. my business partner and I, we would do it, you know, we do like Photoshop stuff all day for the clients yeah. and then, or, or illustrator. And then afterward we took classes downtown, uh, at Berkeley extension okay. and we would go paint all night. So yeah, we were both really into to doing the applied arts in our day job and then mm -hmm. fine art at night. Yeah. So you're still practicing pretty much this entire, yeah. this entire time from when you went to Paris, you yes, came back and exactly. like you said you were doing night classes and stuff yeah, in, in painting. Take, yep. Still take night classes. I'm going to start a night class in sculpture, which I've never really attempted before. So I'm totally excited about that, uh, in February at CCA, but I, I take night classes always. I did just something to keep you, you keep learning. So, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised that, that your dad was so into sculpture and that, um, you, I mean, it, it seems like you're mostly canvas. Have you done much sculptural stuff or? I've done a few pieces. Um, I've done a couple busts, but, um, no, I mean, just haven't really. Um, and I'd love to work in mediums like bronze. Um, so I'm very excited to see what comes out of me in this class. Yeah. Yeah. But it's funny, my dad, I always said, you're artistic. And he would say, I'm not artistic. I'm like, look what you've been doing your entire life. I'm like, I would love to just give you a chunk of clay and have you just do something that's not a car. And he was like, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. 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 There's an interview with uh, Jim Carrey talking about his dad because he, he's Canadian. And uh, 
he said something like his dad always wanted to be like a saxophonist or something like that. And it's funny how, like, like you were saying, the narrative of that generation of like the 50 something parent, 1950s, 1960s parent, it's just like, uh, you know, make a living, that kind of thing. And, uh, I think Jim Carrey said something like, like his dad was just, he, he became so, he became like a shell of himself uh -huh. towards the end of his life because he always wanted to be this saxophonist or some, some type of musician like that. And, uh, he never, he was an accountant or something like his entire life. Yeah. I mean, so. yeah, exactly. Like I found myself at 33, just miserable after the, you know, uh, nine or 10 years of, of finance. And I, w mm -hmm. I was miserable. I'm like, I, if I continue down this path, I will, I will drink myself to death or I will hang myself. I just can't. And so I made that, fortunately made that left turn and, and it took as long as it did, you know, I mean, cause it, like I said, I was raised to be like, you're making money you're, you know, but finally I did, you know, my, my parents weren't very happy about it, but, but, um, I was, I'm much more happy about it for sure. This guy started as a study of one of uh, Joan Mitchell's oils on or, uh, pastels on paper um, that I just was fascinated with. It is uh, based on a cold night, uh, an early, like, you know, late spring um, that had a frost. It's a memory I have of the sun going down and it getting dark and everything looking like it should be summery, but it was really damn cold. And I was growing up in, in Michigan on a lake, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's it. It's got the energy of, of you know, playing outside um, and then the frost coming down and it's a very happy memory, this one, so. And then in contrast, another one I did uh, that is going to uh, a client um, this one is um, another happy memory from childhood. It's called St. Constance. So we had a church at the end of our block and like all good Catholic families, we'd go to church on Sundays. And it was a super cool building that was built in like uh, 61. And it was very Vatican II, like really groovy. And it had these fantastic colors throughout. Um, and I was actually an altar boy there growing up. So I have these like great memories of these like nuns who played guitars and um, these really cool priests and, and, uh, and yeah, going serving as an altar boy. And it had an atrium inside the, uh, inside where the pews were. Um, so this is kind of my memory of that, the, the color palette of that, like on a particular Easter Sunday. I've got another painting upstairs that I could show you that would be really good to talk about. Okay. Shall we go? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, there are, there are milestones. I feel like uh, that we, ha that at least from my experience, like having milestones in the, in life. And then once you reach those milestones, it's like, okay, what's the next milestone? But then there's a certain point where it's like college slash marriage slash like getting the first promotion or something where you're like, okay, that was th mm -hmm. the final milestone. <laughs> now there's like 20 or 30 more years of just this. Right. And then it's yeah. like, okay, do I really want to do this? Right. Um, yeah. I envy people who do what they love and it makes them a lot of money. I mean, that's the trifecta and it's so, yeah. so rare, you know? Rare. So, you know, at least if I do what I love, I, you know, the money will come. Mm -hmm. And even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't exactly, I'm doing what I love. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Definitely a strategic uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned, uh, uh alcohol and, and one of the questions is about creativity that I yeah. have. And I'm, I'm curious, um, cause I know you're, you're, you practice meditation, you practice yoga. So you're very much so, uh, experienced with like, uh, different states of consciousness. And I wonder, uh, if you can speak at all to 
uh, how drugs, and I'll just include alcohol as a drug, mm -hmm. how those have affected your creativity and art making, how yoga and meditation, maybe that's too much in, in one, but, but like how those things affect your creativity and, and what went into that? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, you know, I started painting because it was the one thing that got me out of my, my, it got my mind to shut up. And, um, and I have tinnitus, so ringing in the ears, constant, since I was 18. And, and painting was something that all of a sudden I didn't hear it. I just didn't focus on it. And yoga's the same way, and meditation's the same way. It's those three things get me out of my daily, you know, ego-driven thought process, and, and it just shuts off and I can transcend it. Um, and when I first started painting, being nervous, you know, we would, you're in classes and there's always a bottle of wine in, in painting classes. So we'd always drink wine while we were painted and your painting would get looser and looser. And I'm like, hey, this is kind of good. And so for a while, I felt like I couldn't paint unless I had a glass of whiskey in my hand. And uh, it would just turn off my editor mind and it would let me focus. And, and some drugs as well I've experimented with and led to similar results. But finally, there was a point where I, I can't do this anymore. It's just unsustainable. When COVID hit and we were all isolated and I had a lot of time that I could paint, I realized, you know, there's something had to give and I had to give up alcohol. So I quit alcohol um, for the most part and quit smoking weed and doing any other kind of drugs. And so I was terrified, frankly, that my art would all of a sudden be really mediocre because I was much more, uh, my editor mind was much more there in the forefront as I was putting each stroke down. But um, I met a group of guys who are musicians and writers and uh, who showed me, taught me like that you can paint completely sober and you can write completely sober and you actually get better work out of it at the end of the day. And so um, it took a while, but I got the confidence that, you know, I don't, I don't need to be swilling scotch to make a good painting anymore. So, so they've good, good, um, good ways to alter my mind and bad ways to alter my mind have both played a, a role in my painting career. Yeah, for sure. Do you meditate in the morning or in the morning usually? I do. I meditate in the morning, first in thing. Morning. Yeah. I get up, I write in a journal for five minutes, and then I meditate for 20 minutes first thing in the morning, especially if I paint. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's been, a, that's been a big one. I mean, I've been on and off with that for yeah. like the last five years, and it's, it's hard to stick to a schedule, especially yeah. like if I'm traveling or whatever. But it's only 20 minutes. It's crazy. But the mind makes so many excuses. It's like, oh, but I'll just do it tomorrow. It's fine. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I had like a Buddhist teacher say once, I forgot who said it, but it's like meditate. You should meditate for 20 minutes every day unless you're busy and then meditate for an hour. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you really need it. The opposite of what we do. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, I try to do 20 minutes in the morning and, and it's so difficult. But, yeah. but um, you know, it's like really it's tuning your instrument before you go out and, you know, play with the day so mm -hmm. when you are doing brainstorming or i guess but do you do brain like is there a set period of time where you just sit and brainstorm or do you get ideas throughout the day and then just jot them down and do them with, with the process yeah, of art it's all over the place um you know if i take a million pictures thank god for the the uh, camera on iphones you know i take a picture oh, yeah. Yeah. I take pictures when I walk and I try to, you know, of any pretty colors or shapes or whatever. And I try to um, then come back and sift through those and say, oh, this would be an interesting start for a painting. You know, this like green pot and this black wall or whatever. Um, uh, that, that's kind of the, the main way. I also I read a lot of other artists, biographies of other artists whose work I'm fascinated in. And, and that changes like right now I'm really into color. Um, 
And so I've been reading about um, Nicolas Poussin, who was a, a French Baroque painter who's like a master of colors. And Joan Mitchell was is a master of color. And so, you know, reading about their processes and that, um, yeah, so I kind of get inspiration any, anywhere I can, I guess. Yeah. That was actually the next, yeah, that was the next question. It was like, where specifically? So it's not like nature, taking photos, other artworks, other. biographies. When you say biographies, like their story or like the books of their work? Yeah, uh, a little bit of both. Okay. A little bit of both. Um, the best is if you can find a book that talks about how they painted. Usually it's just like why they painted. But, you know, I want to know, like, how much did they scrape? How much did they apply? You know, how much uh, um, oil, linseed oil did they put in that? How, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And it, it's really hard to come across, but um, that's that's the best when you find it. Do you do anything to increase your creativity that you find like sustainable like i think i think meditation obviously mm -hmm. is, a, is a great way to increase creativity is there anything else like that um meditation yoga um let's see what else uh yeah i suppose those are about it traveling obviously mm -hmm. you know getting someplace new doing something new like i took um I'd always wanted to take ballet and my, you know, my parents would have like shot me if I had asked them, can I take ballet as a kid? So I took it as an adult and, um, for, and for a while going through the exercise of like figuring out how to move your body in space helped immensely when I was doing figure, figurative painting oh, and wow. fi f like figuring out how somebody's foot is placed or their knee in space. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't have had that unless I took this class, ballet, random ballet class. So yeah. stuff like that. I mean, you find inspiration in so many different things. Cooking, I cook every night and it's like scratching the itch. Like if I don't get to paint in a day, I will cook that night because it scratches the creativity itch. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, you know, helps me the next day in painting. So it's, it's all over the place, yeah. What's your what's your go to dish for <laughs> for preparing food? Yeah, my go to dish. Go to dinner. I'll make it a little more specific. <laughs> That's so vague. <laughs> no, my go to dinner is um, well, my family's Italian, so I'll do a pasta. Um, awesome. I'll do um, sear steaks and do some kind of like stewed greens, mm -hmm. like um, like turnip uh, greens or something like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've been experimenting with uh, smoothies lately, trying to get oh, really? trying to trying to get the perfect blend of protein protein powders because I really like pea protein, but I also like uh, hemp protein. So I've been uh -huh. mixing them to try to get like a creamy consistency. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you have to let me know how that turns out because we make smoothies every morning. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and I've just been using the like you know I think it's whey protein so. Mm -hmm. Can you that's, have that? That's really whey. No, because of the dairy. Because the dairy. Yeah. yeah, but pea protein honestly is is pretty creamy too. Yeah. So, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you you were mentioning how uh, something about different places. We you were just talking about that. Just how how you went to different places, and I wanted to um, kind of explore further uh, different places that have had a profound effect on you uh, or your art, um, whether it's your process or the, just the theme, the focus of your art, uh, besides you know, Paris and obviously living where you're living now in San Francisco, Michigan. Is there any other places that um, you've traveled to, even briefly, that have been uh, like influential yeah. for you? Yes, I. Um, my brother lived in... Um, Sweden for 15 years. So I spent a lot of time in Scandinavia. Uh, I spent a couple weeks in Iceland. I spent like cumulatively several months in Sweden, a couple weeks in Norway, and in both the summertime and the dead of winter. And oh, wow. yeah, so um, I did a big series of fjord paintings that were basically, they were monochromatic. Um, and they were all about sky and water. Um, and so just the, the, the beauty of the landscape there, you know, it's so, it's so minimal. It's, um, 
it's mountains and water and, and air and sky, you know, um, that really impacted, uh, uh, how I did landscape painting a lot. And I've been to, um, also to, um, Morocco and the colors there are fantastic. And that's, that really got me then focused on like saffrons and, and deep red roses colors and, uh, browns and ochres and umbers and, and yeah, like a spice box of colors. So really anywhere, everywhere I go, there's something to pick up. I go to Hawaii quite frequently, um, for work. And so, you know, greens, I use a lot of greens in my work. So the lush greens, like every, every shade of green. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So color, color has been a big thing, expanding your palette. Cause really there are yes. like infinite colors, right? Infinite, right. So yeah. even ones we can't see. Did you see any, uh, wildlife in the desolate areas of the Iceland where you're at? Like in the, in the wintertime, especially, right? Cause it's like nothing, right? Nothing. Right. Yeah. Um, we took horses and went, took, uh, like we took two horses and went horseback riding out into the wilds of Iceland. Mm -hmm. Um, and no, I, I can't remember if we saw, we must've saw like a little mul uh, marmots and things, but, but nothing big, but in Sweden, I've seen moose everywhere. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, which is really cool. Um, yeah. What, what, uh, what do, emo what emotion or, or do you, do you associate with, and this kind of ties into the next question. What emotion do you associate with that, that kind of desolateness? Cause that's more of a description of a landscape. But then when I think of that, cause there's these, there's these thumbnails for playlists on YouTube of music. And sometimes they'll have very desolate places mm -hmm. and I'll listen to it. And part of it's the music, but part of it's the image. Mm -hmm. The image is just like, it's just like, it just makes me think of, so, like if there was an emotion for solitude, it would mm -hmm. just be like that, just like being completely alone, but in kind of a beautiful way. Yeah, I've, the exact same for me. Yeah. The, yeah, um, peacefulness, it's just peaceful. Mm -hmm. Like the, yeah. the, there's no visual clutter, you know, mm -hmm. it's cause it is pretty desolate. Um, and it strips it down to kind of like bare, just, you know, it's cause it's kind of like stripping your soul down to its bare essence. So I, I find it very spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. So when I first started painting, as I said, I was afraid of color. And so I just did it, painted it in black and white. And I did a series of these horizon line paintings from travels all over the world. And I spent a significant amount of time in Scandinavia, um, in particularly Sweden and Norway. And in the north of those countries, you have these vast skies and very flat lands. And so I did a whole series. This is the smallest one. They're mostly like six by six of, of a snowy horizon line. So it was a bit of a way for me to get into painting, but with just focusing on one thing, which was line. And uh, so I did this kind of thing, work for five years or so before I started to say, okay, you really need to learn about color. And uh, yeah, so maybe one day I'll go back and revisit that. But there's one back here, but I'm not sure if it's worth talking about. Yeah, why not? Uh, the lighting's gonna be crappy, but. So this painting is really, is a memory I had as a kid. And I was, I was kind of a loner um, and I'd spend a lot of time outside and this was in the winter on uh, William Street where I grew up and everything was frozen but it was just at that point where it was starting to, to uh, thaw and I came across a bunch of uh, purple crocus uh, fighting their way through the snow and it was just such a, such a, a vivid moment for me that even all these, you know, 50 years later, I wanted to capture it. So, so that's, that's what this painting is about, which has got a lot of, you know, the greens and blues and kind of really cold blues and cold purples. Um, but maybe a like little sprig of bright green to, to call uh, on the spring. So. I'm going to ask this question with all this 
this uh it's organized but there's a lot here but are you a minimalist because there's more to your to your space um, here and some of it was very clean and kind of yeah, straightforward so, yeah you know i i would say no um maybe a maximalist which is kind of like a minimalist but with more <laughs> um I've never heard of that. a maximalist we always joke that i'm that because uh we uh, that a, a maximalist is just wants to be a minimalist but can't so they add more and more and more <laughs> so they're maximal but yeah. still have this kind of minimal aesthetic hope so um yeah no i'm not i'm not a minimalist but i could totally i can i love minimalist paintings mm. for for that reason that it's so calming and spiritual and yeah, yeah. any that come to mind um yeah like um the Mark Rothko's, which oh, he yeah. just does the washes of color, layers and layers of, of one or two colors. Um, Robert Ryman, who did, did white paintings mm. in various different ways. Um, Agnes Martin did these pencil-like grids on canvas with really light washes of color. It's very kind of very spiritual. I'll so yeah. Third one. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, oh yeah, I'll send you a link to her stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, the reason I was asking about the whole landscape solitude thing was, uh, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask here was like, are there any feelings or emotions, uh, besides the obvious ones like pleasure with food or, or sex or whatever, but like, are there any specific emotions that you really, uh, have a particular likeness for? And, and the example that I have here is a little cliche cause a lot of people have it, but like the, the fresh smell of rain for mm -hmm. me, always like, it makes me feel just a sense of cleanness mm -hmm. and kind of renewal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is there anything? Is there anything like that yeah. for you? Yeah, I love the the smell of uh, wet rocks. Wet rocks. Yeah, like okay. wet flint. You know, it reminds me of going on hikes. Um, <clears throat> I love the smell in the Midwest when you were kids, you'd get out of the pool and you would put your towel down on the cement driveway. Mm. And there's this particular smell of wet cement drying in the heat. Mm. That okay. is super evocative for me. It brings, it makes me want to paint summer. Um, there was a, I passed by a woman on the street and she was wearing this like really sickly sweet perfume. And it, it flashed me back to like, I don't know, second grade where my catechism teacher had that same perfume and she worked at, she taught us, I don't know, Bible studies at um, St. Constance Church. And that's, and so brought all these memories back and that's how I ended up painting that painting there. So yeah, exactly. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's, yeah. right. that's right. That's right. That's right. And then you chased her down and was like, I need to know the name of that perfume. It was that perfume. <laughs> it's inspiring. Um, let's see here. Mm, yeah, uh, I, I want to talk more about your time in Paris because I think for your story, that's like a huge turning point. Um, it, it, when you actually, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but really feel like art was your calling and, and you wanted to take it more seriously. I mean, that's a huge move to get to move to another country, mm -hmm. uh, another continent, and live there for a year. Um, yeah. but was there a person in your life that inspired that? Or um, you know, what, what caused it to happen then at like 33? Yeah. Um, so in college, I studied... Spanish and French lit. And I had spent my junior year in Spain studying it. And then I never got the opportunity to do it in France. So, cause I graduated and got a job. Um, so I was working out here for a startup. And when my options vested after four years, I was like, I was miserable. And I was like, this is the opportunity I can go and, and, live in Paris for a year. So I did. So that was kind of the, the impetus for it. Um, and yeah, and then 
while I was there, I kind of rediscovered my love for art and my love for making art. Yeah. Did you connect with other artists at the time uh, living there or was it more of like a, cause do they speak English there? That's um, fair, fair amount or? A fair amount. Yeah, a fair amount. But my, all, my other goal was to be fluent in French. So, because I had taken it in college. So I tried to okay. speak French every, every chance I could. Yeah. Um, I met a few artists there, hung out with them a few times. Yeah. It was, it was, yeah, super fun. It was, yeah, it was great. And during that time you were still focused on the fundamentals of, of yeah, like I, realism type stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I hadn't even taken a, uh, an actual class yet. So I was just, it was like me in a sketchbook. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and that's when, when I decided, well, I need to learn some fundamentals. So when I got back to the States and started the creative agency, I also started taking classes at night. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It, going into museums is still something that I see some YouTubers do. Yeah. Um, like artists. And they're, they're like, oh, I'm going into the, the, the Met or something like that to do sketches of this statue or something. Mm -hmm. I wonder with like the internet nowadays... Like how much, like, do you, do you still do that personally? Like, do you think there's utility in going in person to a place and seeing, sketching something that's there versus like just looking on the computer? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, even though the canvas is 2D, seeing it in person, you get a different perspective than like a completely flattened image, right? On Instagram yeah. of that same, like the, the Mona Lisa or whatever. So, um, certainly. Um, it's worthwhile going and doing it in person. I don't do it much anymore um, because, you know, I've turned to abst abstraction, so I'm not going to go and copy an abstract painting. So, yeah, but um, there's totally worth in it, yeah. And I, I want to talk about uh, Yosemite, mm -hmm. the, uh, a work of art that uh, you mentioned in another interview as taking eight years of of work essentially to, to complete, uh, it sounds like it's the most significant work that you've created. Uh, yeah, yes. The, the one that took 10 years. Yeah. That was the one about the, um, relationship with the, with the, um, uh, religious figure. That's the one. Yeah. That's the okay. one. It's yeah. Called yeah. No, it's called Gethsemane. Oh, Gethsemane. Yes, Gethsemane, which is the garden where uh, Jesus prayed before he was arrested and then then crucified. Okay. Yeah, it's called Geth Gethsemane because um, it was at that, that point and when I was 17 or 16 and all this stuff happened that it was like it was an inflection point for me. Like I had I had had a girlfriend mm -hmm. and we were having sex and then I met this guy and then we were having sex and so mm. then there was this long night like of me in in the in the garden in Gethsemane like trying to figure out who the hell I was mm. and that had religious overtones and um all this religious guilt and shame and everything so that's that's um what prompted like what took me 10 years to get through the painting it yeah so we're dealing with a lot of, of a buried guilt and shame and, uh, yeah. Gethsemane. Gethsemane yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I heard Yosemite when, ah, in, in the so interview. Um, yeah, that's a, a, that's a long time yeah, to I, spend on a painting. It, it is. And, um, you know, it's, it's 20 some feet long. And so the studio is pretty small. So for the first few years I had to paint it in just pieces because there's no place to put it all in one thing together. Built it here. I mean, yeah. Right. It's and so, so, big. so finally, yeah, finally I had to get a bigger studio. So I share a studio down by the ballpark with uh, like five or six other artists. So I could finally put it all together. And I realized after you know, six, seven years of painting it that my styles had changed. And so the beginning of the painting was completely different from the last panels. Mm -hmm. So then I had to spend like another two years going and making back and oh, forth nice. and bringing them all back to the same level of energy. So, yeah. Okay. Wow. 
Yeah. Plus, I, I mean, I worked on other things at the same time. It wasn't just my sole focus, yeah. but it was a bit of an obsession. Yeah. Was it the hardest um, yeah. for you to do? As yeah, well? it was definitely the hardest painting I've, I've ever done. Yeah. Yeah. Probably on multiple levels, not just physically, but also. Physically. Right. Yes. Right. No, on all those levels. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and most of the time I will do a sketch first and then try to paint from the sketch. Okay. And in, the, in that instance, I didn't, which is what added an extra few years to the painting because I just started going um, with what I was feeling, and, and then, which is great. But then you need to, then your editor mind has to step in and say, well, this looks terrible. This doesn't work. You've got to fix this. And, you know, so that's why it took so long. Yeah. Are there principles that are, that you, you like consistently follow across the board? Because in art, there's not really any set rules necessarily, but then there's also things like the golden ratio and stuff right. uh, that people try to uphold or think is maybe aesthetically pleasing. Right. Um, I noticed earlier with this piece, you started very fast and then you were saying, you know, you would have slowed down to continue yeah. it. Um, yeah. Are there any principles that you follow, that you try to follow? Um, I try to follow, you know, a good balance of, uh, or a good imbalance of colors. So, you know, if you've got, a bright red in one corner, you need to balance it out with a color of equal intensity or else a shape of a quieter intensity, you know, so you kind of, you need to balance out the pieces of the painting. Okay. Um, same thing with like line and color. Um, you just try to strike a balance. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be symmetrical. It shouldn't be, you know, to be interesting, but there is an asymm asymmetrical balance that you need, that a good abstract painting needs to have for the most part. And so that, that's kind of the, that's the thing I strive for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what, it, what is the purpose of art? Mm. It's the big, the big question. The one I, I'm oh, glad I sent you. Question. Yeah. To yeah. think about. The purpose of art um, to me, the purpose of art to me is, gosh, I guess trying to reconnect us with nature and our natural selves. Um, you know, for, for me growing up, um, I was bullied a lot, and so I became, I disassociated myself from my life. And so I felt like I was an observer um, watching someone who was me go through life. And so I always felt this disconnect. And so what I try to do with art is try to reconnect with that experience of being a human, of being a human in a situation and in, in, in a painful situation, of being a human in nature, and and try to like, you know, short circuit the whole like ego and get around that and get around the the monkey mind and the words and and just reconnect with some kind of essence that I, I guess I would call nature or the spiritual. So to me, art does that good art does that or and, and even in just trying to do it you succeed in a small way of doing it whether or not the art even turns out well enough for other people to feel that same thing going through the act of trying to reconnect to your nature helps you re helps you reconnect so yeah so that's that's basically it for, for yeah what art is to me i uh, hopefully hopefully that made sense i did yeah okay. <laughs> That's fascinating that you connected it to how uh, the, the being bullied when you were younger. Yeah. And when you were going through that, do you, you actually had the experience of seeing it, uh, yourself as an ob observer? Yeah, exactly. Because that's like, I mean, pretty much on the nose what people talk about in meditation is, is yeah, trying to exactly. see themselves as a... It's like true. Spectator, right, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although this one came from a place of, of fear, I guess, or, or wanting to protect myself versus yeah. um, wanting to, you know, expose yourself. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right, here's a more fun one. <laughs> Let's see. 
if you could have lunch with one artist, uh, dead or alive, who would that be? That would be, I would go with my heart and, and go with Joan Mitchell, who painted in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, because she had a grasp of color like nobody else. Um, and I just am blown away by all of her work. And it's my dream to have a piece of hers one day. Um, she, and she was a woman in, in um a very masculine world of the first wave of Abex painters in New York were very like manly and, you know, hard drinkers and, and they had a boys club and, you know, she, she never got her due while she was alive. Her paintings were, didn't sell for a 10th of what the boys did. And, and I think they're better than, I think she's the, the best artist of the Abex movement. So it, it would be her. I think she would be fun. Is there anything um, you you'd want to ask her besides like uh, t talking to her about color? Like, is there anything related to color you'd ask her? Yeah, plenty of questions of like how you know how do you know two colors are going to work or um, how did you a lot of like how did you apply this color and get it to be so translucent or so transparent or you know that those sorts of things. Yeah, just very technical stuff. I would I would love to pick her brain about. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What's the best purchase you've made under a hundred dollars in the last year? It could be for art or not related art. Huh. Uh, the best purchase I've made. Trying to think if there are any tools that I've recently bought. Yeah, um, yeah I bought a squeegee. A squeegee. <laughs> a squeegee, and oh, I've I been that. yeah, right there, yeah, that's it. Yes, I bought this guy, and to help me start, you know, doing some squeegee painting. So to, um, you know, push and pull the paint around the canvas in a different way right. than you do with a brush or with a palette knife or your fingers. So that just creates a very thin layer of paint, even right, right? Right, almost like you like you know, a roller that you, when you're painting your wall, it's kind of like that. So, yeah. um, yeah, I bought a bunch of like tools from Lowe's or Home Depot that you would use to paint a wall or clean a window that I'm incorporating into paint. So is the size of your, your canvases intentional? Yeah, the, the, very much so. Yeah. Um, this five by six painting is the biggest that comes pre-stretched and that um, that Blick will ship. So that's why they're, it's five by six. Would you? I'd want it bigger if I could, yeah. Bigger? Bigger. Bigger place? Yeah. Yeah, I love the feeling because you, you literally lose yourself in it. Mm -hmm. Like when I was painting on my 20 foot painting, I was like way over here and then way over here. And then it felt like I was like in the field that I'm painting, you know, and yeah, yeah. it was really cool. Like it was li literally, you feel like you're creating a universe yeah. that way. Yeah, um, and I don't get that same sensation on like, you know, small pieces. So yeah, you know, you'd have to really focus on it and just you like do. get up, yeah. get up close or something. Right. Yeah. I imagine that would be really fun to just have a massive painting that you're just like literally. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, were there going back to when you got back from from the Paris and and you were taking classes? Were there were there any uh, exercises over that period of time where you were growing a lot as an artist, learning a lot of new techniques and fundamental stuff? Were there any exercises that really stand out to you as especially helpful for you? One of the things is that in a lot of so a lot of new artists will get a teacher whom they really like and they'll stick with her or him for years. And I was going down that road and then my teacher left town. So I got a new teacher and all of a sudden I learned techniques that, you know, that this new teacher was doing. And so from then on, I would take a different teacher every um, semester. And so that's 
something I would recommend to anybody who's painting is don't stick with one teacher. Every, each one has something valuable to teach you. Um, and you expand your, your abilities so much more quickly um, by, by jumping around uh, with different styles. So yeah. that's a huge one. Yeah, yeah. That's probably the probably one of the best answers to the next question, which is like, yeah, if you could return to your 25, 30 year old self and, and advise them, you know, that this is what you should do or not do. This is what you should focus on, not focus on yeah. for, for getting better. Yeah, I would tell my 25 year old self, um, you're going to you're going to fight against your nature for another 15 years. So just stop it now and just go pursue art because that's what you want to do all along. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, I was very grateful that I had a good career, but, you know, I wasted half of my life um, not focusing on something I really love to do for fear of, you know, basically being broke. Um, but just, I would tell myself to go for it. Just go for it and mm -hmm. do it um, and be patient and just paint. Don't expect a masterpiece. Don't expect anything. Just paint and the rest will come. So yeah, patience in, in the, in the process. Have you read a book called, uh, mastery by not Robert green. There's another one, uh, George Leonard. No, I haven't. no. Oh, it's a really popular, uh, book. I'll send it over. I mean, you're, yeah. you're advanced now, but like, I think for anyone starting something, it's a really great book because it talks about the plateau and how yeah. it's all about living on the plateau and like yeah. you, just I need to be patient with essentially very tiny incremental progress with trying to learn anything yeah. and it's like when we're first starting we want to we want to get really good so then we put a lot of energy and because we're new a lot comes fast but then as you get as you get better it comes slower 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 improvement until it's like totally. yeah, yeah you go sure. like months with, with anything, right? I mean, like even with yeah. working out, you know, lifting weights, it's like you yeah. go and then you plateau and then you plateau. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. Um, you just have to be patient. You, the thing is you have to be, not have any expectation when you go and you start painting. Just don't have expectations. Yeah. And it's just one, one day at a time, right? So <laughs> it might take you months to feel like, oh, I'm a little bit better than I was before, but don't even think of that, you know, just, just keep going and, and you will get there. So, yeah. yeah. Another cool thing to think about, um, that I, I think is interesting is that, um, all paintings go through, uh, the same process where you, you start painting it and you think, wow, this is cool. This is cool. You love it. You love it. And then it like, falls into this hole. They call it the hole where you, it turns ugly and, and you hate it and you just got to fight your way out of the hole and you just got to keep going and keep working at it, even if you think you're making it uglier. And eventually you get to a place where it's out of the hole and it's a better painting for it. But every painting follows that curve. So I find fascinating. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I would tell myself, sorry, yeah. I would tell myself, take risks as an artist. Um, I think it was, I think it was Picasso who said that, um, that, that, that went off, is that okay? Yeah, okay. So I think it was Picasso who said that um, a painting can never be uh, successful unless it's been ruined. So, you know, for a long time I was making pretty pictures and I was afraid to put this brush stroke there because it might ruin the painting or I was afraid to add this color because it might ruin the painting. Yeah. Pretty paintings might be pretty, but they're ultimately wallpaper. So what I do, especially if I'm a little stuck, I will just take this color orange and just squirt this thing over the whole freaking canvas. And then, like, oops, now what do I have to do? You know, I have to react to it. Yeah. So, so, and then, then you find your way out of a hole. Um, yeah. So take chances. Don't like, don't be precious with your work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what makes a good painting. So, yeah. Yeah. That's the, I can definitely benefit from doing that more. Yeah. yeah. Just like 
so many times I've been with just anything like you're saying, like anything creative really, or that there's resistance around just wanting being so attached to the outcome that you're just like, yes. I'm just paralyzed. Just can't do anything. Exactly. So. Right. And that's, that is the key. I mean, that's the key to, to progress, I think is to break through that, uh, paralysis and, and, uh, push on. Yeah. Are there any Instagram artists that really inspire you? Or yeah, there are a lot of really talented artists who fortunately also post on Instagram these days. And I have a whole list of them. Can, can we like go do a little like pretend like you're going on Instagram to like look at? Sure. Yeah. 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 That would... um, yeah. So here are some artists that uh, are painting right now and they might not be famous yet, but uh, they really inspire me um, with their work and this. This first guy's name is Ian Rayer Smith, and he's in England. And I really admire the confidence he has with color and with brush. Um, I was afraid of color for the first 10 years that I painted. I was only painted in black and white. And uh, it's only been the past like 15 years that I really incorporated color. And this guy's handling of color is, is very intuitive. Um, it reminds me of like Joan Mitchell's handling of color. Um, and he has this freedom that shows that he's just in command of his tool brush and everything he does just works. Um, there's a rhythm, there's uh, a muscularity in his work that's really cool. Um, and it ends up being these really sublime abstract pieces. And who else here? There's another guy I really dig. His name is Marcel Rosick, and he is in California. And it, he handles color just as well as Ian, just as sublimely, and yet his technique is totally, completely different. And he, I'm assuming he doesn't use a brush. He um, drips his canvases um, like a Morris Lewis did in the 60s. And he's kind of taking it to another level. He's taking it to another level. Um, he creates these shimmering just fields of color and and his monochromatic ones are just stunning if you can see yeah and i'd love to own one of his pieces this one is sublime with the different blues and you know to be able to do a to mix a, gr a greeny blue with a uh, reddish blue um it's just it's just hard to do and the, it, it, the execution's brilliant. And I don't know if I just really love his pieces. They really harken back to the, uh, the abstract years of the early, late 50s and early 60s in New York. So, but yet he's carrying it forward too. So those are right now two of my two main inspirations that I've been following on Instagram. Here is my Instagram. So I've been working on uh, a bunch of different pieces. I had a show in New York and San Francisco going on at the same time, sold a few pieces, which I was very proud of. You know, I thought there'd be like 30, 40 people coming through and even that was making me nervous. And there were maybe 500 people, 600 people come through. But at the same time, it was also magnificent. It was, it was, it was, my, it was that was like the night like right in that photo, I'm living a dream because that was a dream to be repped in New York and have an opening um, in a New York gallery. So that was that was a dream come true and it's certainly a turning point for me, so yeah. I think this is the last serious question and it's one of the other big ones, which is just uh, how, how would you define art? And I'll just preface the, the question with uh, something I actually wanted to say earlier, which, which when you were talking about pretty paintings, which is now with the emergence of stuff like AI art, mm -hmm. which can generate art that just looks like, oh, it's perfect. And it's within seconds. It's like the perfect uh, antidote to the instant gratification of, of people nowadays. Uh, but it's like too perfect almost. You know, it's like a, it's a pretty painting. Sure. So with that in mind, um, like how would you define art? Well, the AI stuff reminds me of when um, photography was invented and became 
the usage became more widespread and artists thought art is dead. Why we don't need it anymore because we've got photographs that can capture a person's face way better than any artist, you know, more accurately. And then, you know, two things happen. We slowly realized that's not the point. Um, the point is the artist's hand in the work. And then artists also then were freed to start exploring abstraction, which is something no one focused on previous to uh, photography. So I think with AI, the same sort of thing is going to happen. Um, the AI pieces are really cool. Um, I would love to, to do them. Um, they might serve as the basis for someone then to paint them by hand mm -hmm. and add the painterly touch and add their personality, or it might send art into a completely different direction now. That's, that's I don't know what yet, um, because it hasn't been invented yet. So it could be an opportunity to move art forward, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, art is just, it's a way for us to Art is a, a response to nature, is seen through an individual's uh, um, psyche, I guess. Um, and I don't mean nature like trees and plants necessarily. I mean like, you know, human nature, spiritual nature, and emotional nature, or, or trees and plants, um, filtered through someone's perceptions and experiences. I think that's what art is, and it's, it's, it's a reminder that it's, it's, um, we all experience those same things, no matter how much, like, you know, how much dust we have on our souls for, from our daily lives, um, that there's something deeper that we all can, that we all can still connect to. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> I don't know if it means anything. No, yeah. Uh, maybe it's just because we're both from Northern California, yeah, so maybe. so we understand we understand all the the language of totally. that. <laughs> Let's get the hot tub now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What's something that most people like that you don't understand? You don't understand why they like it. Um, uh, oh gosh, reality TV. Um, I don't understand at all. Why would I want to see something I, someone going through their daily lives, you know, when I, I can barely make it through my own daily life, I guess that's, <laughs> that, that shocks me. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any? That's actually, a, I mean, I agree. That's a great answer. It's very specific too. Uh, things that people like that I don't understand. Mm. <laughs> Pineapple on pizza? Yeah, no. It's, 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 <laughs> I don't think it's specific. Yeah. Uh... I mean, this one... This one opens kind of a, a whole can of whatever, but I feel like drugs. Uh -huh. um, but I think that has more of a genetic component more than anything else. Sure. I think some people are just predisposed to really, when they have an experience with a substance, they need, they're like, it's, it's like, you know, with me with like food or something, it's just like, I love food and it's hard for me to control myself around food sometimes. Yeah. It's like, it's just like that. But for someone else, it's like, oh, they just need cocaine or something. Right. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Fix. Yeah, for sure. Now, I can understand how people need it. Yeah. Um, that's not for me, but I can understand that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. All right. So we're on to just kind of the fun miscellaneous questions right. now. And these, these are pretty, these should be all pretty casual, I think. Um, yeah, what, what's something every artist should try at least once? Um, gosh, again, I would say you try different teachers. You should oh, definitely yeah. see different, different teachers. And even teachers who, whom you don't think could teach you anything, especially those are the ones you end up learning something interesting from. Try different mediums. Uh, media, try, yeah, 
um, try, try a ballet class. It yeah. really, you know, if you're a figurative painter, definitely take a ballet for adults class. You will learn so much about the body. Go see a, um, go see a, um, oh, uh, an autopsy. If you're really oh, into wow. figure painting, go see an autopsy. See how the muscles work beneath the limbs and, you know, all the tendons where they join and stuff that will help, help you paint a realistic arm. I mean, just, you know. Have you seen an autopsy yourself? Uh, only on, like, only on um, TV. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I'm not a figurative painter, so I would yeah. stay away from it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that would be surreal to see a live autopsy. Yeah, it would be surreal. I wonder if, if that could be organized. I think it can. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Just as like an artist reach right. out to like a right. crematorium or, or no, not a crematorium. Like it would have to be like an official, yeah. an official person if yeah, like government like a hospital. or a hospital. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. Um, what's a, what's an uncommon tool you use every day for making art that would be hard to live without? Um, <laughs> my left hand. So I am right-handed, but I make myself paint with my left hand as much as possible because it forces me to give up control. When I paint with my right hand, I want to paint something that looks like something. When I paint with my left hand, I can't. So it completely changes the picture plane and um, it frees me up to be much more careless and, and not careless, mindless and, and um, selfless. So yeah, so I usually usually only paint with my left hand. Wow, when did you start doing that? Um, I kind of figured that out about fifteen years ago. Yeah. Twenty years, yeah, fifteen years ago I started. Yeah. It was just too much. You were just trying to make too much happen with your right hand. Yeah, too too much control. I had too much control going on when I was painting with my right hand, and my analytical brain was just you know triggered. And so if I would do it with my left hand. Um, it short circuits that. So it was all about tricking the body. Mm -hmm. So, it, and you know, twisting the painting. So I never oh, paint more yeah. than like an hour on, on one orientation. Then I'll usually rotate it 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees and back. So, yeah. and, and sometimes it ends up, you know, the way I started, it's not the way I, I'm going to show it. So. Like this guy right here, this is the way I ended up, but I started it the other way. The blue was going to be like water, and now I, instead I kind of made it a sky. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it started out, though, upside, upside down. I did not even, yeah, hmm. wow. I love this question. What's an uncommon experience which was so positive for you, it makes you sad to know most people will never experience it? I would say, it came to me right away, was um, living abroad. Um, I mean, it is. there's no better way to take you out of your element and out of all of your customs and your ways of doing things and your ways of thinking about things and your prejudices and your misconceptions to go in, then to be put by yourself, not with other people, go by yourself and live in a foreign country. Um, it's, it's mind expanding. Um, and short of that, I would recommend people to go on vacation by themselves to a foreign country and you get a taste of it. And you stay two weeks in another country and you know, see, how, see how people think, see how people socialize, see how they interact, see what's important to them. Um, it's it's a mind, mind opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually, when you said it came to me immediately, yeah. that was one of the options, but another thing and it's something I'm just realizing now that we didn't get really get a chance to talk about was uh, yoga. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, you have been practicing yoga now for over 30 years. And I imagine that you've experienced, had some type of experience with that. I mean, those typically come, right, with, with yeah. lots of practice. 
For sure. Yeah. I mean, the whole like practice of going through the motions is just to clear your mind at the end of the practice. Um, and yeah, and actually like going upside down, doing headstands, handstands, I mean, literally it is literally changes your perspective on things. Right. (laughs) And that translates through to my, to painting, to my painting. It changes my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit random, but are you familiar with uh, Ken Wilber? I am not. Okay. Who's Ken Wilber? He's a he's like a spiritual type author person, uh-huh. and he he talked he talked about uh, like different experiences with yoga and stuff, and uh-huh. and like um, so have you just heard of Samadhi? Yeah. Yeah, like stuff like that, where like focus just becomes very intense, and then sometimes like even when you're sl- you're sleeping, you can have experiences where you're like f- focused and aware you're sleeping but you're sleeping huh yeah uh, oh, that'd be fun so when i hear anyone who's like practiced <laughs> meditation or yoga for like over 10 years i yeah. think like i wonder if they've had that or like anything like that yeah you know? um i'm guessing i have <laughs> yeah i don't know just like or maybe just bliss you know maybe just yeah more, bliss more bliss yep because that's bliss is so hard you know, there's that like, even in yoga, if I can get a split second in, in Shavasana at the end of bliss, like just a microsecond, I'm like, this was such a, you know, worthwhile endeavor all these years. But, you know, it's, it's, bliss is, t- bliss is hard. And it's slippery. Cause then it's, you're, yeah, you know, the minute crazy. you're like, the minute you're like, I got, bl- I, oh, I'm feeling bliss. It's gone. Yeah. 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 You can't name it or else you'll kill it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Painting's the same way. <laughs> um, going in line with sleep, uh, what is your relationship with your dreams? Dreams like my, my REM stage kind of like dream, dreaming, dreaming. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I definitely have very vivid dreams. Um, I have a lot of nightmares. I don't know why. Um, a lot of dreams about ghosts and spirits trying to talk to me, which I love. Oh, wow. It's super fun. It's like riding a roller coaster. Um, like it's scary in the moment, but you know, it can't hurt you. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, lots of dreams of like spirits and ghosts. Do you have, communicate. do you have like coherent conversations that you can recall? Not usually yeah. when I wake yeah. up. Yeah. And most times it's just like feelings emanating from yeah. them. So, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what that's about. Ghosts and spirits. Uh-huh. That's really interesting. Yeah, but I've come to really like nightmares. You know, they're they're fun. <laughs> they're super fun. It's, it's a good horror movie. Yeah, exactly. It's better than like dreaming about work, you know, which yeah. also I do, which is, is tedious. Do you ever dream about like your dream? I, I'm sure you have dream of you painting. You yeah, know, dream oh, of, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, totally. Is it usually continuing on a project you're already doing, or do you ever like dream and you're like you're painting something and then you wake up and you're like, that's a great idea. Oh, yeah, both. Totally both. both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, because that happened to Ed Monroe, the first oh, yeah. artist. He said that happens a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the more you do it, the more it comes to you at night, you know, because you're, you've got all these problems it's, that have, you know, then they find a way out of your, uh, uh, to work themselves out of your subconscious. And mm-hmm. so then when you dream, you figure them out. Now it's super helpful. Yeah. 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 Have you, do you lucid dream at all? Um, yeah, I have not, I'm not regularly. I wish. Yeah. Uh, and I've tried to, I've actually tried, like you can practice, you know, yeah. different things. Do you? I've never, yeah. no, never, never lucid dreamt. I've like lucid daydreamed in bed, but it's not the same yeah, thing. Yeah. 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 I've read a, a few books on it. Yeah. It's hard though. It's, it's yes. like a practice. It's yeah, a, it a practice. thing you got to actually do. Yeah. I remember I had this lucid dream where I was in a, building the skeleton of a building getting chased by a panther and i was running is about to attack it and then all of a sudden i'm like wait i'm dreaming so i can do whatever i want i'm like so i'm going to take this girder and turn around and stab him through the heart oh, wow. and so i did and he died i'm like oh that was great and <laughs> then and then i woke up yeah. afterward <laughs> yeah. oh man yeah so that was like yeah that was lucid if you could choose one piece of art for every human to spend one hour with in a room alone, what would you choose? That is a fantastic question. It would have to be something so 
basic that, you know, without the much um, cultural context needed, that everybody could, you know, get something from it. So to me, that would be something like um, uh, one of Rothko's paintings, which are fields of it's like color field paintings. So just he would do a washes of a burnt umber and then put a big, you know, several layers of red in one spot and several layers of like ultramarine blue and that's it. And they're oversized. They're like, you know, I don't know, 10 by 12 feet purposefully to make you feel like you're mm. in a universe of this, these colors. Mm. And I think, you know, we go through our lives so much looking at color without ever seeing it. And it would be a great way for people just to sit there and contemplate, um, what does red mean to me? What does blue mean to me? What does this red and this blue next to each other budding mean to me? What does the background of brown underlying it all mean? What, what am I feeling? Does this make me happy? Does this make me sad? Does it make me serene? Does it, you know, um, and do I feel small compared to the, this giant, you know, piece of color? And then, you know, that, that sort of thing that, it would be very kind of a basic experience, I think, would yeah. would behoove everybody to to go through. So that that would be my number one. Mm. And the runner up, the runner up <laughs> is um, ask. yeah. Similarly, it is um, a chalkboard drawing by Cy Twombly. So he mm. used household paint that was basically um, chalkboard paint and did these big canvases, and then he took chalk or some kind of paint like chalk and scribbled like, you know, in cursive words that weren't real words. So, uh, and then he would erase them and then write on top of them and erase them and, you know, row after row after row. Like when you were bad and you had to write things on the chalkboard when you were a kid and then but they'd be erased. And then there's another like script on and that's erased and it. It gives you this sense of, of, time like eons of time that you're sit that you that you know you're staring at it like you know there was this it to me it connotes like writing on cave walls that we don't understand what it means anymore and they're they were you know it's erased by time so it's like a history of people had you know wrote something and then that was erased by the sand of time and then somebody else and that was erased and so it, for me, it makes me really think about like the human condition over the millennia um, and just the fact that it's all ephemeral, like this conversation, us here in the Bay Area, like it's it's going to be completely you know lost to the winds in in 100 years and and in a thousand years this, you know, I mean, so, yeah, that I think would be a really uh, f uh, interesting thing for people to think through. Um, uh, as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That one, especially, I mean, I'm familiar with Rock. I'm not familiar with, with the second one. That's a video art. No, it's, um, it no, it's, uh, it's just a painting. It's a yeah. Painting. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you, but you can see like erase marks and then uh, scribbles and erase okay. marks and scribbles and yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's a, is, is that the the artist explained that that's the meaning behind it or that's just your interpretation? Because that's a beautiful interpretation and I think that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure. He was really into um, Greek and Roman mythology and okay. ancient literature. So I'm guessing that was kind of part of his intent. So um, he did a lot of painting of like, you know, the uh, ancient um, Greek philosophers and okay. stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting like goosebumps a little bit. I'm just like my body's like, oh yeah. yeah, if I'm, I, yeah. It's kind of like you forget stuff. you forget that you know. It's yeah. a, it's a reminder. It's, it is a good reminder. I think that would be a great thing for people to kind of be reminded of. It's like, oh yeah, yeah exactly. nothing really matters. It's all gonna go away. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and to wrap it up, mm -hmm. the, the final question. Speaking of you know, when we all die and then a hundred years later, a thousand years later, it's like, it's all gone. Uh, hypothetical for you. A mother is uh, teaching her son about art 100 years from now and your name comes up in the painter section. Uh, what would make you 
most happy for it to, to say? Oh my goodness. Uh, what a great question. Um, I would be happy if it said that Ronnie Gennati painted something true. He painted something that made people feel. That would be it. Mm. Nice. Yeah. Simple. Simple, yeah. Yeah, because then, then my, my work here would be done. It's, you know, I would have accomplished what I set out to do, which is to hope is to get other people to, to feel something um, from the feelings that I put on the canvas. So. Great. Well, that is, that is all of the questions that I have. So that was a lot of questions. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I think we're going on like an hour and a half or two hours now, wow. something like that, maybe an hour. Um, well, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak with you on, on art. It's, I love speaking on art. Yeah. It's fun. I, I actually enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, this is yeah. this is the first time doing the podcast versus the interview, and I I prefer this. Um, yeah, this was a great approach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, where can people uh, find you if they want to learn more about you and your work and and connect with you? Yeah, I'm, uh, my Instagram is rjanati, uh, and I have a website ronnygenati.com. Um, or at Agora Gallery in New York, or Radian Gallery in San Francisco. So cool. And Genotti is G E N O T T I. Yep. So R Genotti and uh, Ronnie R O N N I E Genotti dot com. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Yeah. Well, now I understand why people like podcasts. Yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> How do you turn that off? Hit the record.